we have a friend who's amazing. He has written and has had published 776 articles. He's an island specialist, or rather, as he calls himself, an island traveler par excellence. He's a philatelist, attends major stamp shows, no matter where they are, in the States, abroad, Steve is there. He's traveled twice with us to Pitcairn Island, and he's going to speak to you today on The Neighbors. Pitcairn isn't alone, though it might seem so. Steve Pendleton, please. I didn't say I was an island uh, traveler par excellence. That was quoted in another article in AP. <laughs> well, yeah, the guy, wrote, he wrote about the Islas Evangelistas and had assumed I'd been there, which isn't true. Uh, but anyhow, uh, thank you so much. I, I feel like I'm among family here, and I recognize so many of you from 2005. And if you're a stamp collector, well, you know, you've been to so many shows, and uh, it's like, coming home. Well, I thought that uh, to talk today, it might be interesting to do something a little bit different. Since you guys have uh, been talking or listening or about, everybody's been talking about pit care in the last two days, uh, I thought it would be appropriate to put pit care in a, how should I say, in, in its environment. I think one mistake we make sometimes when we're so enthusiastic about Pitcairn is that we forget where it is. It's in the Eastern Pacific, and there are other islands there too. Now, I'm not going to talk to you too much about the other islands, except in one context, which comes in a little, little um, in, the, in the future here. Uh, but I think we need to know that if Pitcairn is going to survive you know, over the next 20, 30, maybe 50 years, you have to look at Easter Island, Juan Fernandez, uh, some of the other islands around there too, because uh, there's a connection there. Well, what I'm going to do in the next 25 minutes or so, and I have no idea how much I'm going to talk since I haven't timed this before, but I want to consider three things. Uh, Pitcairn in ancient times and its relationship to other islands. What Fletcher Christian had to know before he decided to come to Pitcairn. And then Pitcairn and the other islands today and in the future and how so knowing about the other islands can help Pitcairn. Because I, th I think we need to really concern ourselves with that. Um, I didn't know it for a long time, but you know, Pitcairn had been, a, been inhabited before the uh, mutineers got there. You know, it had a Polynesian colony, which had disappeared possibly 100 years before, the island, before um, Fletcher Christian got there. Well, the anthropologists have studied the possible path of this. And it would have been between about 600 and 800 AD to possibly 1000 AD from Tahiti through the, through the Tuamotos up to Mar uh, Marquesas, and then down to Henderson and Pitcairn Island. That's the path they think. They're not positive, but that's the way they think the ancient Polynesians migrated down into that area. Now, if you know anything about Henderson Island, you know that it's not a place that's ever going to uh, hold much of a population, uh, for today, of course, for obvious reasons. But uh, it never was a place that had much water or food, anything like that. And uh, when the ancient Polynesians got there, because they did settle Henderson, and they had a colony there for, they think, several hundred years. But they never had a big population. It was always like 50 to 100 people. Couldn't support anymore. Uh, and they finally took off. You know, They left hundreds of years before uh, any white man got there. So you had this colonization. Now, there might have been, although I, I'm not sure if any proof has been made of this, there might have been a trade, well, we know between Mangareva, but possibly to Easter Island. Uh, of course, what you could get from Pitcairn is obsidian. Uh, you 
know, because and, and obsidian is a fantastic mineral for those of you that know anything about minerals. You can do all kinds of cool things with it. I mean, like nowadays, uh, even the best physicians in the world use obsidian knives when they cut you open because they really hold a, a real, real sharp edge and they don't, uh, they don't get messed up with um, skin and blood and stuff like that. So, you know, so, sorry to make it so dramatic for you, but, but, you know, it's nice to know that they're using good instruments. So anyhow, obsidian's a really great material. Uh, you can do all kinds of things with it. So it would, be, it would have been a nice thing for uh, the ancient Polynesians to have traded. Okay, well, now let's get on to what Fletcher Christian's choices were. All right, as probably most of you know, the mutiny took place in the Tongan Islands. Um, there's a group there, Tofua and, and Kau, two twin islands where the mutiny happened. Now, Christian knew enough about those areas to know that uh, landing on any of the Tongan Islands would not have been a good idea. Uh, I, I think they sh very shortly would have been shark food or other food, uh, as the case might be. Uh, so when they sailed off, what choice did he really have? If he went west, he'd hit a, he knew there was a lot of populated islands out there, but that's the trouble. They were populated. And some of them were populated by nice people, and some of them not so nice. Uh, so you would have a big problem there. So when he went east, well, of course, he decided to settle at Dubai first. But that didn't work because there were Polynesians there. He could have gone to the Austral Islands, uh, but they were far away, small, and populated. And of course, the biggest mistake that some of the mutineers made was deciding to stay in Tahiti. I mean, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out that the British knew about Tahiti and that they were going to come back. So when they decided to land on Tahiti and stay there, they were putting a noose around their necks. Maybe they thought the British would never come back, but no, no, no. So when Fletcher Christian left Tahiti, he didn't really have much of a choice. For one thing, Henderson and Ueno weren't known. They hadn't been discovered yet. Now, of course, we know that Pitcairn had been discovered, but we know it was mischarted. All right, he could have gone further east. He could have gone to Easter Island, but again, Easter Island was known and it had several thousand people on it. And I, th I think they had known that it was getting pretty desolate even at that time. He could have gone much further east. He could have gone to Juan Fernandez or Masafuera. Uh, those were not occupied. So he could have settled there. But the problem with, with uh, Juan Fernandez is that it was very well known as a um, watering place. Ships had stopped there constantly to reprovision, get water, and like that. Now, Masafuera is an island that's about 80 miles out of uh, uh, Juan Fernandez itself. But the problem with Masafuera is it's like a big rock. Uh, not much there. So the Chileans now use it, or did use it as a prison. But, you know, he couldn't have gone there. And there really isn't any much else place out there. There is one little place. Um, I'll just mention this in passing because you might have seen it on a map. Uh, it's called Saleo Gomez. Now, I don't know if any of you looked at the pictures that I had over there, but I, I have actually had a picture of Saleo Gomez there. And it's really, it's not even as big as this campus. It's like, I think, four uh, football fields across. That's it. There's nothing there. You know, uh, nothing grows there. The sea spray gets over the whole place. So forget Masafura. The only thing it's any good for is sea eggs because uh, somehow the Easter Islanders got to sail 200 miles over there and they go to get um, Easter eggs there. But if you look at the rest of the map of the Eastern Pacific, there's nothing there. Uh, when I was on Easter Island, uh, I was told that when you go to the south shore of Easter Island, the water comes from Antarctica and the waves come all the way. You know, uh, there's a place there called Ahu Tangariki which got wiped out by a tidal wave in 1960. It was the waves that came all the way in from the Antarctic. It's like 4,000 miles. So there really isn't much choice there. 
So now I think we can sort of understand pretty much what his uh, real choices were. Now, of course, I'm sure he was probably thinking of maybe finding it on some uncharted island. No. <laughs> They're not there. So, I mean, he could have sailed south. Hey, that's 4,000 miles of open ocean. There's nothing down there. So, okay. Now, the thing that I think is most important about what I'm going to say uh, in the rest of this is the other islands and Pitcairn today and in the future. Now, we've, we know that we've, we've got to service with the Claymore and we've got to service with the uh, yachts and like that from Mangareva to Pitcairn. Well, okay, that makes sense. Mangareva is about 300 something, I think it's 330 miles, okay? Uh, now, you can dream about an airport on Pitcairn. And I mean, it would be a great dream. But think about this. Uh, your total landing strip area that would be available is possibly two to 3,000 feet. I don't know if you could build one any better than that. Think of the amount of land that it would take on Pitcairn to construct an airstrip. Now, you could probably do it, but would it be safe? You know, think about flying from Mangareva to Pitcairn. Something happens, there's a storm or something like that. You got to go back. It, it could be a, how should I put it, a hair raising flight. A couple of months ago, I found a crazy site on YouTube, which was the 10 most horrible airports in the world. And I looked at some of the places that people would fly into, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, that could be Pitcairn. You know, now, you know, I, I don't like to puncture dreams, but I'm not sure if I'd like to take an airplane. When I saw something like, like, like an airport in Nepal where you fly it in, flew in over a cliff and there was a thousand foot airstrip and then another cliff facing you. Uh, so if you fly in and you can't stop, well, uh, oh, but if you fly out, you go over a thousand foot cliff. And if your engine stops, well, nice knowing you. So what, what are the possibilities? Well, I've been to Easter Island a couple of times. And Easter Island is fascinating in a lot of ways. I gotta tell you, I don't know why anybody would wanna spend more than a day or two there, but people do. And one of the things they've got there, they've got some nice hotels. Uh, Hangaroa is a nice little town. I mean, it's, it's nothing special, but it's a nice little town. It's interesting to see the Moai, to drive around and do all that kind of stuff. But what it does have is an airport. And it's not just any airport. It's the biggest airport in Chile. And a lot of people don't know that and don't know, know why. The, long, the airstrip, as long as it is, is because the United States, in its infinite wisdom, spent millions upon millions of dollars with the Chilean government to extend the airstrip across because they wanted to use it as an auxiliary or emergency landing strip for the shuttle. So if the shuttle still existed and it if ever had problems coming in, it could land on Easter Island of all places. <laughs> but what that also means, since 1967, is that Land Chile has flown in, I don't know if they do it daily now or every couple of days, I haven't checked, but there's a flight from Santiago to Easter Island to Tahiti and back. It's very expensive, but Thousands of tourists do it. So you've got on Easter Island, thousands of people. Now, it, you gotta be rich to do that because Land Chile is not a cheap airline. Uh, and I don't know what the hotels cost in uh, Easter Island, I've never investigated that, but I'm sure they're pretty expensive. Uh, in fact, the last time I looked, Easter Island had a population of somewhere close to 5,000 uh, uh, considerably more than half of who are Chilean. And the Rapa Nuians do not like that very much, but they can't do anything about it. I mean, you know, uh, it would be bad for them. But here is this clientele. And what do they want? They want adventure. And that's what you get on Easter Island. But what could be, I would think, more lucrative than a connection between Easter Island 
in Pitcairn. If somebody could get a boat, or think of some way, hey, balloon, I don't know, you know, but some way to get between Easter Island and Pitcairn, I think you could get a lot of those people that go to Easter Island. I mean, they were running Concord trips into Easter. You know, it was sort of amazing. The, the people would hire a Concord, and they'd get like 50 people on board this plane, and they'd fly around the world. I don't know what the cost was. I think it was like $60,000 per seat. And they, they'd land at Easter. You know, uh, so wh why couldn't some of those people go on to Pitcairn a little bit? So it, it had struck me that that would be a place that we might take a look at. Sometimes we just think, oh, we're, Pitcairn's out there between Mangareva and wherever the heck, you know. But there are ways that it, that it could be uh, brought into the, to the uh, world system. Now, there aren't very many other islands out there, as I've said, but it seems to me it's a very underrepresented area in terms of tourism. Uh, I think everybody should know, for example, like, like uh, Juan Fernandez. Now, when I went to Juan Fernandez, I'm no expert on it. I mean, Ted and Barbara spent a couple of days there, so she should, they should give you the, clue, the inside scoop on Juan Fernandez. But it's a beautiful island. You can also fly into it. Although, I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I would think uh, Barbara's doing this like this. And if you've seen a picture of the airport there, you know why. Uh, it's between two cliffs, and it's an airstrip, what, about 600 feet long? Something, something like that on a good day. So uh, an airplane that's like uh, six or seven people can fly into there. But to visit that place, I mean, all right, granted, the hotels aren't very much, uh, but if you're a real adventurer, who cares? You know, uh, as long as you can stomp the cockroaches you know, pretty easily, then, then it works out okay. But visiting there, I think to, to me, Masafuera is another fascinating place. Uh, it, it's like a like a dome, and in the 1900s, the Chileans used it as a prison. Uh, for that's where they put their presidents. If, if you got kicked out as the president of Chile, you got sent to Masafuera. So. Uh, you know, it would be an interesting place. It's very hard to land on. That's a problem there. But all of these little islands there, oh, and, uh, and I should mention the others, Henderson, Waino, and Ducey. Uh, I think we should do more in terms of, of attracting people, not just to Pitcairn, but to those islands as well. I mean, look at what, what the islanders do with the Waino. They go there and have a party every year. Uh, and all the pictures I've seen of Ducey, I don't know if I'd want to uh, spend too much time there. I mean, what is it? it's Coral Atoll? So I think I'm going to close now and let you all get some lunch just with this thought that Pitcairn isn't alone and that we need to consider uh, the entire area, not, not just the island, but all of the other little islands around there uh, as something that if they come together, if we can bring them all together, bring the information of, to the people of the world that like to travel, that here is some really cool islands, not, just, not spoiled by tourism or development or anything like that, but real adventurous. I don't know, I hope that's the future. I hope that can bring people to Pitcairn. Thank you. <laughs>